Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today involved in creating a better tomorrow. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Joelle Elbezuzan who is the head of the Nuclear Safety Office, uh, overseeing the development of the DEMO or DEMO fusion reactor at the Eurofusion Organization. And, and DEMO stands for Demonstration Power Plant, referring to uh, this novel proposed class of nuclear fusion experimental reactors that are intended to demonstrate ultimately the net production of electric power from nuclear fusion. Uh, and this is you know under the umbrella um, of the Eurofusion Organization, and we talked to uh, uh, Dr. Donay a few weeks ago, which, uh, as a reminder, is a consortium uh, of various national fusion research institutes located in the European Union, UK, Switzerland, and Ukraine, established back in uh, 2014 to succeed the, uh, the European Fusion Development Agreement. Uh, as an umbrella organization for Europe's uh, fusion research laboratories. Uh, prior to this role, um, Joelle spent over a decade um, at the uh, ITER organization, head of division of nuclear safety there, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, uh, focused on what was being built uh, in Southern France currently upon uh, completion uh, of their reactors and then their plasma, which I believe is planned for uh, 2028 or so, uh, which will be the world's largest uh, magnetic confinement to, uh, plasma physics experiment and largest experimental tokamak uh, nuclear fusion reactor uh, on the planet. Uh, prior to this current role, that role, uh, Joelle also spent several years as deputy head of nuclear safety department at the uh, the French uh, Alternative Energies and Atomic Energy Commission, uh, which was a, a major player in research development and innovation uh, in this area. Uh, Joelle studied engineering, uh, where she specialized in instrumentation and measurement, doing various comparative studies uh, between all forms of energy, and ultimately uh, transitioned uh, into this area of nuclear. Uh, and um, really a lot of exciting topics to getting into today. Uh, Joelle Elbezuzan, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Hello, come, you are very welcome. I'm very pleased to be with you today. For us, it's the afternoon. I know that for you, it's the morning, but anyway, we are here. <laughs> <laughs> well, at any time, it's it's great to have you, Joel. Um, you know, I I, um, I I spent time reading all about you and and sort of your background in engineering before the show. Um, I would love if you know you could start off uh, just to hand you the floor for a little bit to talk a little bit more about you for the audience. Um, if you could sort of take us into your background story of where you grew up, uh, your interest in engineering, and then a little bit of what, as we say here in the United States, when you you got bitten by the new nuclear bug and your passion <laughs> moved towards nuclear. Talk, talk a little bit of that background story, if you yeah. would. So, yes, indeed, I was born in Marseille, south of France. Uh, and then when I was uh, very young, I was already very interested by all the scientific aspects. You know, I was uh, asking a lot of questions to my poor parents who were not able to answer to them. <laughs> and then... Uh, Rapidly, I wanted to, to, um, to get an engineering degree. And uh, in particular, I, I was particularly interested by uh, the energy, uh, the astronomy, uh, the, with the stars in general, you see. 
and then um, the space as well. So at the beginning, I wanted to make some study in that area in more uh, space uh, domain. And then very quickly, I took some orientation more related to the energy. And um, at the same time, I was attracted by the protection of the environment. Because, you know, I don't know if it's due to the fact that I am a woman, but I am very concerned by the impact on the environment, about the global warming. And I think that is not only a fashion for me, because since decades, I am uh, dealing with that topic. And in particular, when you develop all this uh, nuclear energy, there are a lot of, let's say, hazard, but they have com completely under control. And if they occur, if that happens, if something happens, you could have some impact on the environment. And my goal is precisely to avoid any impact onto the public and onto, onto the, the environment. So I would say that like, it was like a conviction for me. And I was quite young uh, when I started to speak about uh, uh, such a matter. And that was one of my motivation in doing scientific uh, st uh, study and, uh, uh, and in getting this engineering uh, degree. So you see, finally, the life is like that. I got many opportunities to work with very prestigious people, very competent people. As you said, I work in uh, Atomic Energy Commission. And that, at that, in that uh, commission, it's very interesting because you are able to, to see and to, uh, let's say, cover many kinds of experimental nuclear facility, so the, which are totally innovative. And it's not the power plant, it's really what will happen in the future. Hein? And then, obviously, you need to ensure fully the nuclear safety, all these kind of facility installation in order, again, uh, to, to, to protect the, the environment and the public. Because a part of the feasibility of all these future reactors is definitely uh, supported by a good safety demonstration. And then that we have to be sure that it's very safe before to start uh, to, to develop such a, a new kind of experimentation or, uh, in, term, in the nuclear uh, domain, obviously. So you see, it, it's very easy, very logical. I was concerned by this protection, environmental protection. It was uh, very important for me, a very important topic. And I think that now the climate ch changes can uh, demonstrate that we have, there is a kind of uh, urgency to, to deal with that. And at the same time, to provide energy to everybody uh, in order that we can live in a in normal way or at least, uh, yes, a comfortable uh, manner to, to, to live. Uh, as a human being. So that if, if I, I, after I, I try to develop a bit more about what I did in, during my professional life, uh, so yes. as you explain very perfectly, uh, uh, I start immediately to work in the uh, with the Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, and after I moved to ITER organization, actually when France has decided to present a site to welcome it there, to implement it, it there, this first fusion machine, a nuclear fusion machine in the world and in the history with such level of nuclear power, uh, the uh, Atomic Energy Commission set up a special team. And I was one of the members of this team. Into, it was in 1990. And then I've been at that time responsible for all the nuclear safety studies in order to uh, demonstrate, to show to the different members that the site of France was a good site and a safe site to welcome Inter and to, in order to build this international project. And then I moved to Inter organization when Inter organization has been created and during 12 years, I have been the head of a nuclear safety division and environmental protection uh, division. And then I was in charge at early of 2010 to get, to grant the licensing, the license of ITER, which was the first 
nuclear installation to be to get to get such a license mm -hmm. and that it was an historic milestone uh, and i was uh, i would say the first uh, first line front of the french regulator in order to get this authorization to create it there mm -hmm. and then to start the const construction so it was a fantastic adventure and obviously uh, there are many people uh, there were many people behind me and uh, then we succeeded it was a very let's say uh, difficult challenge because you know the regulator in the world are all very skilled to speak about fish and plant right now, so they know their art you know there are some kind of a framework they, are, they know where are the many issues the weaknesses but for fusion for them it was like a science fiction you know right. So, it, so it, it, there, there was a need at the same time to educate these people, to explain them uh, this new technology and to convince them that it's safe. Otherwise, you don't get the license. And otherwise, it uh, was not, would have not be authorized to be uh, constructed. Mm -hmm. So you see the consequences of this, uh, of this license, what we call the licensing process. And that was a very let's say, passionate uh, time and period of my professional life, where I meet a lot of people from a lot of nationalities. And I would like from person, I would like to say that the multiculturality of this project is just fantastic. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you, you meet, you work with different people, with different mind, with different culture. Uh, and that it's really a fantastic uh, human adventure as well. So it was a, a, a fantastic experience at a technology level, at a scientific level, but also, also from human point of view, you, you, you see. So. Got, it. Got it. You know, that's... Um... It's 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 quite interesting, you know. As you're, you know, you were just pointing out um, when we when you talk about sort of the history of of fission technology, and you know, we you know that we had um, uh, Lydie uh, Evrard on from the IAEA a couple of months ago talking about you know sort of her activities there uh, in safety. But again, as you were just pointing out, you know, um, when you're dealing with technology that's been around for a while okay you know there might be changes here and there okay here's the, yeah here's nuclear here's a well here's something a molten salt reactor and we can make some comparison but but with with fusion it's almost like you're you're learning uh, and developing regulations as exactly. these techs exactly. are happening like when, when tony was on you know i asked him this question about you know okay a lot of this works with tritium but then there's this helium three and boron stuff over so you're constantly even before this even exists you're developing safety and 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 <laughs> for something that isn't turned on yet talk about what that process has been like a bit yeah. i mean sort of, yeah, what, what so are your what are your meetings like uh, when somebody proposes something that uh you know might not be until 2030 but oh we have to think about safety now <laughs> things of that yeah, nature but it's a very good question actually is a, is a core question i would yeah. say uh, because, um, you know, when I, I was used to license fission reactor, fission installation in general. So that it was quite, I would say, conventional, difficult process always because the experts from the regulator are very skilled and they know very well the regulation, how to implement it and the level of accepted, acceptance, acceptability of the safety demonstration. So I would say that this kind of process is always very challenging, very, very challenging. But as you said, we know what will happen. We have a decade of feedback. It's not the case of fusion. It's not the case of fusion in terms of a nuclear operation. When, for instance, for fusion, I say that there are specific loads due to the plasma event, so the physics itself. There are some events which are, well, we know them, but what will happen on ITER? will be confirmed by ITER experience itself. So you need to convince the regulator on something that you cannot predict with 100%. So you need to explain to them that you will take some additional safety provision with additional margin 
in order that you will be able to remove the impact of these uncertainties, because this is a matter of fact that there are, the uncertainties are here. So after, how do we deal with that? It's very simple. No, it's not so simple, actually, to tell you everything and to tell you the, the truth is not simple. But it's a question first of education. You have to explain what are the main difference? What are the different uh, uh, physical phenomena? What are the impact on the confinement barrier, which are the main, let's say, safety function in the fusion machine? What are what kind of a level of level of energy that will be deposed of this confinement barrier? That you are sure that this confinement barrier will be enough robust to resist to this energy and to avoid any spread contamination to the outside to the environment. How many confinement barrier do I need as well? So you see, I just give you an example. So. You say that I will have this level, finally, I could have 10, 10 times more. So I need to add another confinement system. And also, I need to make some margin. I, I need to add some robustness into the design of this confinement barrier. And that it's a, a way to give confidence to the regulator that you will be able to cover any contingency any evolution of a, of a load that you expected at the, at the early stage of your design process. And it's a lot of interaction, it's not a lot of calculation, a lot of extrapolation. The goal, if I make a summary, is simple, is always to be able to give confidence to the regulator based on the factual demonstration, so on the scientific demonstration. Huh? So that it was like that. But I would say that the most important part was the education of the expert of the regulators. It was this period of a dialogue with the different stakeholders where you explained the phenomena and where you convinced them, or not, but most of the case we have to, huh, to convince them, that finally what you propose, the safety provision that you propose, is the right one and will allow you to face any evolution of the loads of the energy that uh, you could be developed during the plasma event. And then it was just an example, obviously, uh, it just to, to give some illustration. Sure. There are more conventional hazard as well uh, in, a, in a fusion facility due to the tritium mainly. Uh, and again, it's a question of uh, how we could affect how can I challenge the confinement barrier? And how can I produce a, enough robust design of this confinement barrier in order mm -hmm. to contain the radioactivity inside the facility and to avoid any spread contamination to the environment? Or if there are any, because there are very few, uh, they are very limited. And that it was the first. Uh, Another topic, another argument that we develop a lot during the licensing process is the impact of such a fusion machine uh, on the long term, on the future generation. Mm -hmm. You know, from the waste, radioactive waste point of view, it's a matter of fact also that such a machine will generate the radioactive waste definitively, sure. but at the short term level and not during thousand years which is completely different with the other uh, uh, nuclear installation. And that is a huge, huge advantage to not let to the future generation a legacy in terms of radioactivity, right. of radioactive impact, of nuclear impact. So. Excellent. Joelle, you, um, you have published you know, extensively on you know, the, the various components of what I'll call the safety equation. And I thought it'd be very interesting to talk about some of these with you, some of the some of the recent stuff you've been publishing just sort of so the audience gets a, a perspective on the types of things that, you know, in 2023 you think about uh continuously as you are simultaneously designing 
uh, this reactor. And, and I just thought, you know, uh, because this one just published a couple of days ago, actually, it was uh, in a, a journal called Energies. And the um, the title of this particular paper uh, was the development of a thermal hydraulic model for the EU demo tokamak building and local uh, simulation. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah, it, it just I, I'm glad yeah, I found yeah, this one. Very recent, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but the interesting thing, and, and we can go into different parts of this, and we'll, we'll talk about sort of the, um, uh, the 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 radioactive materials and such. Yeah. But you know, the, you you highlight in this paper, it, there's three major things, right? The, that safety, what we have to think about. We have to think about radioactive materials. We have to think about the complexity of everything going on. And then the fact that there's extremely powerful energy in this little building, yeah. <laughs> needless to say. And yeah. simulation per, you know, what yeah. some of what you've written in this paper is extremely important because, yeah, it's not going to be here <laughs> in its complexity until a couple of years from now. Right. Talk a little bit about sort of the yeah. role of simulation when it comes yeah, to, yeah. you know, no, that, that is also a, a very important part of a nuclear safety. So, you know, yeah. nuclear safety is based on different tools, I would say. One of those tools is a simulation. Another tool is the result of the experiment which are performed everywhere in the world, okay? If I want to identify, to, uh, to know about the aggressive rate of tritium in some specific metal, I can put in place a specific place, a specific experiment and make some measurement simply to understand what could be this odd guessing rate. So that is, I would say, the experimental part. There is also uh, the simulation part, which is purely calculation part, where we use some specific code which have been developed for fusion, adapted to the characteristic of fusion, where you could make some simulation about what could happen in case of an accident with all the extrapolation that I just explained to you uh, regarding the margin that we need, okay? So at the end, what we need to understand, for instance, for the thermohydraulic accident, what you, the last paper that we have published, is related to the over pressure that can be released in case of a break, in case of a uh, yeah, break of pipes containing water, a pressurized are more than 100 bar, so which is a lot, uh, with a high, very high temperature. And what could be the impact of this famous confinement barrier? What I explained to you is like, you know, you want to cook and then suddenly the temperature increases and then you need to remove the cover, otherwise something will happen and you could <laughs> be affected. You see, it's, it's absolutely the same. Yep. So I would say that here, this kind of study, this kind of publication that we did very recently, just demonstrate what could be this kind of overpressure. And finally, that will help us to design the building itself, so the confinement barrier in terms of the thickness, in terms of the quality of the concrete, the, because this building will have to fit with this overpressure and to contain this overpressure in order to avoid to push the radioactivity to outside. So you, you understand. So this is why it's so important. So this simulation, this simulation, obviously, we will not make any experiment uh, to provoke a nuclear accident. I think it's clear for everybody. Sure. But this simulation is are done with a certain level of conservatism, by the way, in order to give us with a good confidence, what could be the physical consequences of, a, of, of such accident. And then after, I, as an engineer, I'm responsible of a nuclear safety, I will take this parameter and I will instruct the designer to consider this parameter into the design of the building itself, into the design of the confinement areas, what I explained to you initially. So there is a very important link because the target is a protection of the environment. Between the environment and the radioactivity, there is this confinement barrier. And this confinement barrier, in order to be sure to design them properly, correctly, I need to evaluate what could be the level of overpressure. And to do so, I use this simulation tool, which are, which are very, very important. And we are using this simulation in many other areas. And honestly, uh, 
This is a large part of the safety demonstration, no longer nuclear facility, but in particular for fusion, I would say, where we are still missing some lesson learned in terms of operation of mm -hmm. such a facility versus fission, where we have more than 50, 60 years of lesson learned. Right. So it's completely, I would say that we are starting almost by the scratch, almost then the simulation are very key. And when I say to you that this simulation is very important in our safety demonstration, it means that this tool must provide truth, correct result. So we need to go to a validation process. And this validation process is also a key topic in nuclear safety to be sure that this code, this simulation tool will produce provide to you a correct value in order to design properly your installation, your facility, your confinement barrier, with a final target to protect the people and the environment. So you see, everything is linked. I don't know Excellent. You know, Perfect. Hmm? You know, along those lines now, uh, additionally, uh, Joa, you've, you've published a lot over, and I, I, I saw papers going back to the mid 2000s. You're, you're publishing on on tritium, on 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 sort of the uh, the safety and sort of different lessons learned along the way. And then recently, I think in October uh, was the 13th annual International Conference on Tritium Science and Technology. Um, and then I think at this, um, you and your team presented on sort of the inventorying of sort of what goes to it, which is tritium plus everything else in the sense that you have cooling materials and various other chemicals that are involved in yeah. dealing and so forth. Um, take us a little on that path as well. And then yeah. also, how, how many people show up at a tritium conference? I'm just, I, I mean, it went, I saw it went on for like a week, but I are there thousands of people of there? People. Is it a small fraternity? <laughs> what, what goes on there? A lot of people. Okay. Now, actually, this paper was very important because it was a result of the months and months of work. Yeah. As you said, you know, the radioactivity is something, well, we have to manage. And the best way to avoid any problem is to control the radioactivity. To control the radioactivity or to control any topic, you need to know the topic. So you need to know the different inventories. So again, this machine, the fuel of the fusion machine is the tritium. Mm -hmm. So you inject tritium deuterium and you obtain some uh, neutron or 14 MeV. And then this, finally, this is a nuclear reaction. Fine, very good. But this neutron will have some impact on two the different components surrounding the plasma, what we call the indesal component. And then they will, they will be activated by this neutron. And then they will become radioactive. So they will become a source. So it's what we call radioactive material, OK? Then also, you need to cool the different confinement barriers. So you need to cool the vacuum vessel, where the mm -hmm. plasma is rich and after the nuclear reaction, the fusion reaction, second. And then you will, use, you will use some water, some water rooting in some pipes, which will enter inside this vacuum vessel, going out and going in. And then you cool like that the surface in order to avoid any overheating of a, of a, of a vacuum vessel, of this vessel uh, containing all the nuclear reaction. And then when you do that, this water will have an effect of to corrode the pipes itself, right. even if it is uh, steel, so it will be corroded. And then it will uh, generate some, what we call corrosion product. So you have some, some corrosion product like in your pipes at home, huh? you have some corrosion product sure. that are deposed inside the pipes. But when this water, which transport, transfer these corrosion product that will arrive inside the plasma chamber where the neutron are generated, then the neutron will impact the water. And in particular, the, not the, the, the water, so the oxygen, then, then here you generate some specific 
radionuclides, in particular nitrogen 16 and 17, which are very, let's say, demanding, challenging in terms of definition of uh, shielding. But that I will explain to you after, because we sure. need to shield also this machine. But also you will activate this corrosion product that have been generated by the water, which are transferring inside the pipes from the outside to the vessel to the inside to the vessel and then running in order to cool the surface, okay? Mm -hmm. Then here, it's what we call, we will, we will generate activated corrosion product. And that is another radioactive inventory, okay? So it's cobalt, uh, nickel, so all these metal, uh, which are after activated, so they are radioactivity. So you understand, we have tritium, we have these activated corrosion product. I told you as well that we will generate, we will activate the oxygen of the water, and then we generate some specific radio elements like nitrogen 16 and 17. Mm -hmm. So I will not go too much into the details, but at the end of the day, you have a set of radioactive inventory mm -hmm. that could be mobilized during an accident mm -hmm. and that could be spread out outside and that we need to avoid that. We need to avoid that this radioactivity right. are spread outside again. So in this tritium conference, we precisely present uh, such uh, uh, inventory, such determination of inventory, because this inventory provide to you the level of the dangerosity of your machine. Okay. So the fact that we have tritium, corrosion product, dust, right. that we have uh, also these radionuclides, which are quite uh, short time, short life, so they disappear within a few seconds, but they are very challenging in terms of the shielding definition and impossible impact onto the worker and then onto the public. This, this inventory determines the level of your of the dangerosity of your machine. But in efficient plants, you have plutonium, uranium, and all what we call this alpha emitter, fission product, yodine. And here, after, when you compare the both kind of inventory, and when you know what could be the impact onto the health if they are effectively spread out, it's a matter of fact that tritium is much less impacting, impacting the health of the human being than the plutonium, for instance, mm -hmm. much more, sure. much less, much, much less. Okay. Sure. So then finally, this definition of inventory is key when you design a nuclear facility because you know the level of dangerosity of your facility, then you know the precaution, the level of a precaution that you have to apply when you design the facility, when you will define this confinement barrier, when you will provide safety features provision in order to avoid any spread of contamination. So this is why we always start by such inventory. Mm -hmm. What could be the radioactivity, the radioactive inventory that is present. So we did the same for it there 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And now we are doing the same approach for demo where we would like to know which kind of inventory and how many, how much do we have of tritium? How much do we have of corrosion product and so on and so on? Because when there is, for instance, a break in the cooling water system, what I explained to you, this overall pressure could take with the, with the over pressure can take this radioactive material and push this radioactive material to the environment. And because this is an overpressure, so mm. there is an energy and then we have to avoid that this material is spread everywhere. You see, it's always the same objective. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, you know, when I, um, when I go online and I Google ITER in, in Southern France, I, I get, you know, a bunch of fascinating images of of everything that's going on with the construction. And I mean, it's the most complex thing, <laughs> you know, one could look at. Um, 
Are, are you located in Southern? How often do you get to the um, the experimental plant to and sort of what is your? I mean, obviously you you you're responsible for safety. We talked about the construction, the materials, but how often are you on site specifically seeing the reactor being built and and involved in sort of all these pieces? Um, how does that fit into sort of what you do on a daily basis? So you know, safety is a transversal function. It's a yeah. transversal activity. So it's a, it, we are in interaction with all the designers in all of the domain. Right. Thermohydraulic, plasma, mechanical component, heating yeah. system, electrical component, breathing system, fuel cycle, tritium fuel cycle. And then we have, we have to interact with all of the designers and in particular to provide to them what are the safety requirements in correlation with the level of inventory that I just mm -hmm. explained to you. Sure. So I will impose a certain level of safety requirement following the level, the dangerosity of his inventory, to, to, to speak very easily. Then I go to the designer and I explain to them, look here, you need almost two confinement barriers with such characteristic. It, it has to resist to 100 degrees, to two bar absolute. It has to resist to a fire a temperature of 800 degrees. So, you know, it depends of your system. So your system is located, is what we call an overall architect. So this yeah. is a overall architecture. You discuss with each designer and for each system of, and for each system under the responsibility of each designer, he will need to get from us, from the safety office of demo in particular, a list of safety requirements. We impose a list of safety requirements which have to be considering to the design in order, again, to reach our target to protect the public, the worker, and the environment. So that it's, 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 it can be said very easily, but actually it's a very complex uh, process because it's involved, as you understand, a lot of skills. So safety people have to be able to cover a lot of uh, skill in terms of design, okay? And then what is important is the interaction between the designer and the nuclear safety engineer, because obviously the designer would like to reduce the level of safety requirement because there is a cost impact. It's expensive, obviously. Sure. And at the same time, safety will, will push the designer to keep a certain level of safety requirement in order to be sure that we will not face any issue. So for instance, I can say, okay, I need this thickness of, uh, of tungsten, for instance. But if I, I, I said 10 millimeter, maybe the designer can tell us, no, no, it's only five millimeter. And then it, it will not be sufficient for our point of view. It's not enough from safety point of view because we have inventory in this location, in this room. There is a certain level of energy and I need absolutely to have a very strong and robust confinement barrier in order to protect. So you see, it's, it's very complex. Actually, in case of a demo, how we work, so me, I am in Germany, in Gershin, close to Munich, and I am working with all the European labs everywhere in Europe. So it represents tens of, uh, of, of labs, laboratories which are involved, and more than 40, 50 people who are working with me in these labs in order to develop the design of demo from safety point of view. So if we can make two kinds of activity, they can support me in developing the design itself, regarding yep. the inventory, the energy, and the design itself, the safety provision, technically. But also, there are a lot of people who are making some simulation, uh, and they are, they are experts in simulating some accidental conditions, scenario, and then they provide to me some results that are very useful in the development of a design of a demo. It's what we did for repair as well, by the way. It's the same, same approach. But in case of ITER, it's involved, involved also, uh, it's involved uh, over a country outside EU. Right. Uh, so you have, you have US, Japan, China, Russia, India, Korea, 
So yeah. it's a lot of uh, people. It's much more complex, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at this. There's another picture that comes up alongside the reactor and it basically shows the reactor and then all the countries and specifically what parts of the reactor they're, they're yeah. involved in. So it, it's much it's bigger than just the EU. <laughs> yeah, it's very difficult because you, you, first of all, well, when you design a machine, let's say that we design just one, the vessel itself, where the nuclear reaction will take place. Uh, okay, so it involves at least two partners, European uh, partner and the uh, Korean. Okay, so let's consider that it's only these two. It's more complex because the supplier chain is very complex, believe me. And obviously, when safety, define a safety requirement that I deliver to EU and to Korea, they have after to flow down this requirement through their supplier chain that will do the job of fabrication, that will perform the fabrication itself. And the most difficult part of safety is obviously all the design activity that I, I, I told you. But the most part is the implementation of a safety requirement, which is just writing in a paper with a pen, and the concrete implementation during the fabrication. So it's very complex for us to follow all this fabrication. So after there are a lot of tools which has been put in place, in particular to control the interfaces between the different components and to be sure that all the safety requirements, because at the end of the day, for ITER and for DEMO, by the way, it will be one and full integrated machine. And we have to be sure that at the interfaces between different components, everything fit well. Mm -hmm. And everything consider also the safety requirement everywhere. So if I say, I would need to have a leak thickness for this system because it's containing tritium and I don't want to see tritium inside this system because of, of the worker protection, because of the worker environment. If I say that, you, you, you will understand easily that I need to be sure that the material which has been selected by the different connection system will be effectively uh, able to contain this, this tritium. And if there is a, a, a part of this system which is fabricated by China, another one by US, when they arrive together to be installed to develop this machine, to, to make the assembly of this machine, we have to be sure that the interface uh, will be correct. So it's very difficult. Honestly, it's very difficult because it's imply many stakeholders and we need to be sure that all the activity will be fully co Korean, Korean, consistent, sorry. And then that we will be able to make the assembly of the machine. And it's one of the difficulties of this fusion machine, not, not, not only their machine, is one of these difficulties yeah? because it implies a lot of people, a lot of country with different industrial method, method, method and also at the end, we need to be sure that the machine is unique, is yep. only one machine, but developed by multiple, I would say layers of skateholder. It's a lot of, a lot of layers of a skateholder which are involved, obviously. Well, it's one of that, it's what I told you, there is, very interesting from this part as well. Oh yeah. Real challenge from technical mm -hmm. point of view, but also from human point of view. And even from industrial point of view, uh, because you sometimes you solve problem by uh, mobilizing several countries because alone we are not, we are not able. Right. That is, is fantastic, is collaboration with different uh, and nationalities. is really uh, fantastic, this part. Because you, 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 you see that the human being is able to solve all the possible technical issues. Right. Simply by being seated around the table all together. And that is fantastic, honestly. Very. <laughs> <laughs> Joel, Joel, take us um, 
forward into the future a bit because I mean, I point it right. This is one machine. Okay. I mean, with the power of collaboration, everything gets worked out. Uh, obviously, you, you have an amazing mind, an amazing team, and going to solve all these existing issues. We move forward. Um, I I was reading this one article. This was written, and you were interviewed in this um, magazine, uh, Thematic Resources, Nuclear Safety, this part of uh, Institute de Radio Protection et de Sorte Nucléaire, <laughs> IRSN. I'm, I know skewering my French here, but still. Um, <laughs> the, the, t- <laughs> <laughs> the title of this article, though, was uh, 250 tokamaks throughout the world, uh, which I assume, I don't, I don't know, but, you know, it sounds like uh, at some point, um, if we, you know, take the vision and we, you know, we head out in the future a bit, uh, we have no energy problems at some point uh in the future um do you still have a is 250 sort of the vision of what you know i don't know when we're to 2050 2060 whatever the time frame is um yeah i mean this is a uh a technology that we've been working on a long time but it seems like it's coming to fruition faster than ever before what, what's your future visions joel take us a little bit on we solved all the safety stuff that's over yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take us. Yeah. So now, yeah. Take us out into the future a bit. What, what, what do you first say? My perception is, for sure, fusion will contribute to this uh, energy development, and uh, it, it's a matter of fact that it's not a short term. Huh? Uh, uh, we, we have uh, we have to tell the. The, the reality, the reality is that it takes time. The system are complex. They are either is the first of a kind, and demo will be some somewhere first of a kind. Right. Then the the development of this energy is still quite young, I would say. So this is why it, it does at the short term, it will not contribute to uh, uh, produce energy for the human uh, beings. And then it will not contribute to the global warming as well. Warming as well. So uh, in the short term. But uh, when this facility will start to run, to operate, and will start to produce the energy, then we will certainly fusion will play a major role in energy uh, production and uh, and i would say um, rapidly but we need this time which correspond at least between 10 and 20 years still before to enter to that maturity level because the electricity, the power production, obviously, is a final goal of the demo. Huh? This is our goal. Sure. It would take, okay, at least 20 years. Um, and then we can say that fusion will contribute to this energy production at the medium term, at the middle of the century, but not at the short term, definitely. So this is why all the nuclear country in the world have decided to uh, develop more the fission energy and then to restart this nuclear program. But this, this energy approach uh, after has to consider the, the low carbon energy and the impact again, as I explained to you, uh, for the future generation. And it's a matter of fact, and also the instantaneous impact. Uh, and it's also a matter of fact that the nuclear is very limited in terms of impact in normal condition. And we are putting all of the effort, as I explained to you, to design this facility to avoid, to limit the spread contamination uh, to the environment. There is no energy without impact. There is no energy with zero impact. If somebody tell you that, it's wrong. Uh, so uh, 
all the efforts are, are done in this direction. So the future of fusion is very important, but it's not a short-term future. True. But well, at the same time, we are in the phase at the engineering level that we are learning about this kind of machine, about the engineering development, about the industrial method to fabricate these components as well, which are completely new. Yep. I don't have time to give you all the details, but they are completely different than the one used in fission installation. Oh, yeah. So the future is great, but not short term. Well, I um, I live in this house here, and um, I have three kids here. I read that you also have three kids that yeah. <laughs> take up a lot of your time. Um, what, what what do you do, Joel, in your downtime? Um, what, what do you do to relax? And um, what's more challenging, you know, uh, solving the fusion issue or... Are <laughs> uh, 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 taking care of three kids. I know what it, it's been on, on my end. Don't ask oh. such a question to a mother. <laughs> <laughs> Never. No, no, no. It's, it's okay. When I am at home with my family, I am a mother. <laughs> and then I enjoy very much with my son, which are very challenging person, by the way. <laughs> and uh, also when I am, I am in my professional uh, life. Now, to, to be honest, you know, you, everything is a question of a balance. And the oh, most yeah. difficult is to get this balance and to maintain yeah. this balance. And it's uh, it has to be renewed each day, actually, <laughs> for my yeah. case. In my case, it's a perpetual uh, equilibrium that I, I'm trying to reach. It's, it's not obvious. Yes, it's, yeah. a difficult, it's a difficult challenge. Understood. <laughs> 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 well, I, um, you know, it's so impressive, um, everything that you've been involved in and everything that you continue to do to, as you say, you know, you're, you're, you're creating the future um, uh, for us as we speak. Um, it's a fascinating program uh, that you're involved in and your team. And just really, you know, wish wish you the best for all of this um, as you solve these critical issues and, and move us into this uh, cleaner uh, era of uh, of energy and energy production. Um, again, for everybody that's going to be listening to this particular episode of our show uh, across the various podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel, again, you've been listening to Joel Elbozuzan. Head of Nuclear Safety Office, Demo Fusion Reactor at Eurofusion. Uh, Joel, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us and educate us on these topics for a little while. Obviously, thank you again for what you and your oh, team do. Uh, and as we say on our show here, you know, thank you for helping to create a better tomorrow uh, for everybody around the world via what you do. Really a great story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ira. It was a very interesting exchange. I like very much. <laughs> You're welcome.